Binomial started back in uh, 2014. As we saw it grow, particularly in the spot markets, we saw that volume and interest grow. We thought, hey, there should be a futures market for this. This makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's a, it looks like a commodity to us. We should look to create a futures market for this product that's pretty volatile to try to reduce it and make it a bit more um, you know, palatable to the general market so they can use it to, to trade and hedge risk and do everything they want to do with Bitcoin. Why did Bitnomial partner with Luxor? They're a big business in the mining space. They have a mining pool. Uh, but one of the businesses they have is in, um, an OTC bilateral forwards market for hash rate. And so what that allows them to do, that allows them to work with their customers and allow their mining customers to hedge that hash rate risk in their forwards markets. Now, John, I'm sure you know that, you know, the OTC bilateral forwards markets have their place. Um, their role, there is volume there and, and people can trade them, but they are a bit cumbersome, particularly at scale. You know, every customer has to get an ISDA, you know, there's margin requirements that, and it's very bilateral and there's counterparty risk, right? So the natural evolution to, to hash rate is to have it in a, um, a listed centrally cleared market. And that's where we come in because we have the, uh, the exchange and the DCM license with the CFTC to do that. Obviously, you know, we have our Bitcoin futures and options right now. So we took it upon ourselves to, you know, increase the, the hedging tools that miners have from not only Bitcoin hedging, but now they can do hash rate hedging all in one platform. How do hash rate futures work for hedging? To hedge, um, it's very similar to, say, uh, you know, a, someone who drills oil or maybe someone in the ags business who is looking to, you know, determine, hey, how much is it going to cost me to, to plant soybeans and corn? What's that cost? And then what's my break even point? And then, you know, can I use a futures market to hedge that to kind of have a, what I would say a, you know, you can, you can build in a profit margin there and, and, and plan that for the future to kind of, you know, manage your balance sheet volatility. So there's nothing different here. Um, my Bitcoin miners are in the same, in the same boat. They uh, need to determine what's the price of producing Bitcoin. And that's a very well-established method that the couple inputs here, for example, is, all right, what's the cost of procuring the machinery to do it? Um, what's the cost of staffing to do it? Um, what energy prices am I going to have to pay? Um, and then basically, what's my expected revenue in Bitcoin? You put that together, you can develop a, what we call a fixed cost of Bitcoin production. So you can look at determine how much that is, look at your break even points. And then with our futures market, you can go and see uh, what hash price is trading along the curve. And uh, you can hedge that risk and uh, protect yourself and lock in that margin of profit. Um, and, uh, you know, protect yourself on the downside. Uh, much like any other commodity producer does in the United States. I mean, I think a lot of the mining industry um, for Bitcoin isn't doing this right now. I think there are some you know, innovators in that space that are doing that. They're trying to secure loans for CapEx and building out operations. And you know, I think the lenders are going to start to require this type of thing. I mean, could you imagine if you were uh, you know, an oil driller and you basically went out to creditors and said, yeah, we're not really hedging our oil exposure at all. Um, and, you know, we're just going to let it ride. I think they would have a hard time, a hard time securing debt financing for that type of thing. So I think it's a very similar play. It's very traditional, actually. How will the Bitcoin halving affect the hash rate futures? <laughs> the Bitcoin halving is a really interesting thing. It's kind of reminiscent of some seasonality to commodities generally, like traditional, like agriculture and things like that. Um, but it's on kind of a done uh, four-year fixed schedule. So um, I think the current expectation is April 22nd is when the halving will be. So basically what that means is that approximately every 10 minutes right now, uh, if you mine a block, you get about six and a quarter Bitcoin. Um, and then after that period, you'll get, you know, half of that. So three, 3.125 um, to be precise. So yes, that is, vol that is volatility. It is well known about what time that's going to occur and you can price that in. Um, so there will be kind of a dramatic pricing effect from one day um, from one block to the next, um, for one trading session to the next, I should say, uh, for hash rate features. Now, one of the, the things that we do here is um, there's a difference between sort of our daily settlement price of our contract and our final settlement price of our contract. The daily settlement price is kind of less interesting. That just uses kind of the current actively quoted and traded price on a market, very similar to a lot of other commodities like our Bitcoin futures, for example. But the final settlement price actually um, is computed as an average over a 30-day period. Um, this is very similar to electricity futures, um, if you're familiar, John, where they basically, they basically take an average over a period of time since it's a continuously delivering commodity in a sense. 
So what we do is that the final settlement price is actually an average of those calculated uh, Bitcoin hash price in dollar terms over 30 over 30 days, which is approximately, I'm sorry, it was for 4,320 blocks, which is approximately 30 days. So as you go through the delivery month of the contract, the actual, the final settlement price becomes more known and the volatility decreases. So that's one way to kind of, uh, to offset the inherent volatility of a halving. Now, of course, this is only every four years. So, you know, in between that time, you don't have that type of volatility there outside of Bitcoin fees, but um, and things like that. But at least the at least the reward is 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 known. Who has access to these futures contracts? We have multiple um, FCM partners. So anyone that um, currently has a, an account through any of them, um, this will be accessible to them. Um, so that's we're kind of looking to have everyone ready to go on day one. Um, Luxor also has uh, an introducing broker that they're going to use as well. They kind of that allows them to fan out to a little bit some of the smaller customers um, and anyone that's in their uh, mining pool, things like this, so they can trade. Um, but yeah, anyone who who has access to an, an account with our current uh, FCMs or Luxor's IB, for example, they will be able to to trade these products. Right now, we have Merex Capital, RJ O'Brien, Stonex, and then we also have Binomial Clearing. How do Bitnomial's physically settled contracts differ from cash settled contracts? You take a Bitnomial Bitcoin contract to delivery, you actually exchange the Bitcoin for dollars. Um, very similar to any physical contract on CME, like, you know, corn or wheat, right? So you, <laughs> you expire that long contract, you're going to get some, you're going to get some cars of corn. You're going to get some bushels of wheat at the end of that. No different here. If you expire long with Bitcoin, you're going to get that Bitcoin. Um, Obviously, on the short side, you, you, you deliver the Bitcoin. Cash settled contracts, um, like we see um, on other U.S. exchanges, um, you know, they, they settle to an index and it's just a cash settlement process. So I think the biggest implication there is that if you have Bitcoin on your balance sheet, much like most of our institutional hedging customers do, like I talked about miners, they have an issue where they have the Bitcoin on balance sheet. They can hedge along the futures curve, but when they take it to expiration, it just nets out, right? They just send that Bitcoin along and the trade's done at the price that was already executed at. If you have, if your hedge instead was a cash settled contract, um, while the dollar settlement piece is done, you still need to move that Bitcoin off your balance sheet. And so as the market scales, you can see how there is more opportunity for slippage, uh, more opportunity for, um, you know, this being a very crowded trade. So for example, say you have a lot of people trading the basis between the physical and the cash sale of the future. Everyone's going to be wanting to get out of the last minute. So, um, you know, there's that big difference there of having one trade and being done uh, versus, you know, you needing to hedge that risk in the cash settlement, then having to do something with the, with the physical at the end of it. Um, so we've seen a lot of demand for that. I think the biggest thing that we've seen difference in, in the nearest term has been in January, obviously, when this um, when the spot Bitcoin ETS were approved, you can see that there's a market shift away from um, people just wanting, I would say, price exposure to Bitcoin, um, but they actually want to have it backed by physical Bitcoin. And that's why the spot ETS have been such a big deal. And we're seeing that demand flow through the system. And I mean, if you look at some of the stats, you should see the amount of um, the the inflows in the in the uh, physically backed ETFs. It's it's almost like ten to one of Bitcoin being produced daily. So we're in a situation where physical Bitcoin is going to be in so much demand that um, that people are going to start looking at other different types of products and how to to facilitate that demand rather than just cash sale products, which is only really good for cash exposure. With Bitcoin in the spot market. Will more people come to you to take delivery? I think so. Um, what's interesting, a very unique property about Bitcoin is that it's, quite frankly, it's very easy to settle and deliver, unlike a lot of commodities, right? Like, John, you could, you could, if you wanted to, easily take deliver of a physically settled Bitcoin contract, right? But you could not easily take delivery of corn or oil. I don't know if you have a, a, some warehouse in Cushing, Oklahoma, but you probably don't. But you do have a phone, which means that you can you can take delivery of Bitcoin if you wanted to. So I think that the ease of delivery um, and then the demand for the physical um, from a hedging and just a sourcing perspective um, plays into the physical markets growing um, and as we scale uh, and being kind of more uh, and safer for pricing and, and sort of risk management. <laughs>